Do you, do you regret making that remark? No, I have great relationship with God. I have great relationship with uh, the evangelicals. Donald Trump has joined the race to campaign for the White House presidency for the second time. He emphasized his belief in God during his last campaign, which received great support. In America, we don't worship government. We worship God. If he can launch a campaign that affects both Americans and touches Christians who trust him, his chances of winning will be higher this time. In line with his strong belief in God, he recently issued a serious message to Christians. What was it about? And why is it causing people to panic? Join us as we expand on the terrifying message Donald Trump gave to America. The former U.S. president, who still wants to run for the position again, looks forward to the support of Christians he pledged to have policies that protect them while he's protecting his faith as he runs the race for the position of the president. There are quite a few spiritual people who foresee Trump's victory in the 2017 election. One of them is an Italian who claimed that he received a prophecy in the 1980s that a man named Trump would bring America back to religion before Mr. Trump was elected as the president of the United States. Also, a number of media outlets ran headlines such as, maybe God did choose Trump to be the president. Now, with the 2024 race underway, many Christians are placing their faith in Trump's return and victory. Trump also believed God is and will always accompany him in this race. During his recent election campaign, he warned Christians against violence and that the energy for that should be used in canvassing support for him. This warning and his backstory sends chills down the spine of Americans. Evangelicals have provided solid support for Trump, yet he's trying to keep his supporters on his side, urging them to go out and get more support. Trump said if they don't, it will be the beginning of ending everything they own. He said the evangelical leaders could help solve this by urging their congregations and followers to vote. In his words, I just ask you to go out and make sure all people vote because if they don't, we're going to have a miserable two years, and we're frankly in a very hard period of time. He added that you're one election away from losing everything that you've gotten. Trump's point is that if Christians did not support him, no one would protect them like he will. Christians have always been the focus of attack, so they need someone powerful to protect them, to which he has come to fit the position. Trump once said, as long as there is God, we will never belong. Whether you are a soldier standing guard at the night shift or single parent working two jobs, God will always give comfort, strength, and encouragement needed to keep moving. During the National Prayer Day of 2018, Donald Trump said, Americans of faith have built hospitals that care for the sick, homes that tend to the elderly, charity houses for the orphans, and minister to the poor with love. He added that they are proud of our religious heritage and as a president, I will always protect religious liberty. We've been doing it, and we've been doing it. Because of his strong faith in God, Trump shows no support for those who deny him. According to him, those who have false beliefs will not find guidance because he believes he was able to achieve all he does because he believes in God. Trump's view on his campaign. Donald Trump shared a bizarre video on the eve of the Iowa caucuses where he proclaims himself as God's chosen caregiver on earth, sent to deliver America back to prosperity. June 14, 1946, God looked down on his planned paradise and said, I need a caretaker, so God gave us Trump. This viral video shows Trump as a vessel of a higher power sent to save the nation. The three-minute clip opens a grainy footage of a long-playing record, turning on a record player that broadcasted an ancient sermon in which the preacher, in said, In June 14, 1946, God looked down on his planned planet paradise and said, I need a caregiver for my people. So God gave us Trump. What follows what the preacher said is the photograph of the Republican tycoon as an holy infant, then the montage of apt scenes from his presidency, then a scripture narration where God said, I need somebody willing to get up before dawn, fix this country, work all day, fight the Marxists, eat supper then go to the Oval Office and stay past midnight at a meeting of the heads, if state, 
to which, why God made Trump. The voiceover of the video said, I need somebody with arms to wrestle the deep state, yet gentle enough to deliver his own grandchild. Somebody to ruffle the feathers, tame the cantankerous World Economic Forum, come home hungry, have to wait until the first lady is done with friends, and then tell the ladies to be sure to come back soon and mean it. So God gave us Trump. The odd video concludes with God anointing Mr. Trump as the shepherd to lead his flock and pledging that his man assuming he can secure the Republican nomination and beat Joe Biden at the polls in November will drill for fossil fuels, create more American jobs, secure the southern border, build the U.S. military, and fight the system all day while still finding time to attend church on Sundays. In summary, the video shows that Trump appeared due to God's will and that God is showing it to the Americans. Sharing the video, Trump shows he agrees with it and confidently acknowledges his presence and his importance to America. According to Daniel 2.2, then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. And Romans 13.1, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. These scriptures point out that God does choose leaders, just as Trump and the evangelicals believe he is chosen for America. Though some world leaders didn't quite agree with these views and policies. Another side of Trump's views is this phrase, only God becomes a speaker. He joked that only Jesus could secure support from the House of Republicans to win the speakership. While talking to a group of reporters in New Hampshire, Trump emphasized on the difficulty of the four-vote threshold. The maximum number of House of Republican candidates can afford to lose in a floor vote while still winning the Speaker's gazelle. That four threshold is very tough no matter who it is. Trump said that there's only person who can do it all, and that person is Jesus Christ. And except Jesus comes down to affirm that he will do, then no one else can. Perhaps what Trump meant is the only one who gains in this victory is Jesus, and Hoover is interested, must be ready to yield and submit to his lordship. Trump is never shy while talking about his love for Jesus. He publicly announced his faith and hoped that his power would protect his faith. Trump always calls on people to trust in God, stamping the understanding of the existence of God on people's minds. But why do people believe in God? Because they can sense Him at the deepest level of their natural life. Life, love, and meaning are morally connected. The law of karma happens everywhere and anywhere. Both bad and good behavior has its own happiness, and sorrow results simultaneously. But this concept exists in the center of all religion, which is the true definition of morality. But Jesus' version of it sounds like the measure you weigh it out is the same measurement you will receive. In reality, if we give love, we will get love back, and if we give anger, we will get anger back in return. Trump once said he does not want to ask God for forgiveness because he wants to be responsible for his actions. It doesn't mean he is denying God, but he just wants to make sure he's responsible for his own mistakes while many individuals will want to ask God for forgiveness for their sins. According to natural law, if you do something wrong, you will be punished. You can't escape it. Though Trump still wants God's guidance on the right path, and so is everyone too. If a powerful person goes the wrong way, it will reflect badly on the world. But we should believe in God because blind chaos could not have designed things this way. To be innately moral and only an intelligent goodness could have created things the way it is. Another reason for believing in God is the existence of soul, intelligence, love, art, and altruism. These concepts couldn't have emerged from billions of comics activities with no loving force behind them. Someone like Trump always needs alertness in intelligence and soul to make important decisions at times such as this, and the same applies to us as individuals. Our decisions, whether big or small, should be guided by God. President Donald Trump has often used religious language while in office, surrounded himself with evangelical leaders and conservative Christian organizations. However, Trump's personal religious beliefs and practices have not been as prominent. 
Americans generally do not believe Trump is extremely religious. According to a new Pew Research Center survey, the majority said Trump is not too religious. 23% or not at all, 40% said he is religious, while 28% say he's somewhat religious, and only 7% say he's very religious. From the respondents, 44% say Trump is a Christian, with 33% saying he's Protestant, 8% saying he's Catholic, and 2% calling him just Christian. In addition, 16% said Trump has no religion, with 2% believing he's an atheist and 13% describing his faith as nothing in particular. In his appreciation for God, Trump said he treasures all the Bibles he has, whether bought or given. He also affirmed that there's no way he would ever throw anything to do anything negative to the Bible. So, what he does when he gets them through mail is to keep, store, or give them away. In conclusion, we believe in God because of the community of faith that extends back to the beginning of time, to life, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Throughout history, virtually in all human communities, there will be a community of faith who believe in God, worship, sacred rituals, and sacrament. Trump said in an interview that he doesn't consider himself to be a Presbyterian again, though he was confirmed in the church and has affirmed he was several times but more. He now considered himself to be a non-denominational Christian. Trump also stated that he had met with several faith heads and leaders around the world together with his wife. And during the COVID-19 breakout, he turned into several virtual church services, which he believed most Americans did too. According to the nonpartisan Public Religion Research Institute poll, most Americans don't think Trump has strong beliefs. Roughly 40% says he is using it for political reasons, while evangelicals who voted for him see things differently. 59% said Trump has strong belief in some ways. Trump's decision to disassociate from a mainline denomination is also part of a larger cultural trend. Changing religion identification is also common in the United States. Social scientists called this act switching. This includes dramatic conversation when someone has a born-again experience but also changes subtly. This experience happens more when there are lots of choices to choose from, like in America. Switching also happens when people take religion seriously and think it's an important part of their personality, like they do in the U.S. Even so, Trump believes he's the president who has instilled a belief in God in many Americans. He said with public declaration of his faith, it gave many Christians boldness to stand and declare their beliefs, which means that they came into light under his protection. There are still rumors about Trump's real purpose for running the second time, but one can't conclude yet since the race is still on. It's just a wait and see what promises and actions Trump will make for Christians to have their support. Timeline of Trump's election and campaign. Since the 1988 presidential election, Trump has been mentioned as a potential presidential candidate in almost every election. Trump announced himself a likely presidential contender for the Reform Party in October 1999, but he withdrew on February 14, 2000. In 2004, Trump stated that he identified as a Democrat. He rejoined the Republican Party in September 2009, then chose no party affiliation in December 2011 before rejoining the GOP in April 2012. Trump stated during the 2011 Conservative Political Action Conference that he is pro-life and against gun control. When we declare our schools to be gun-free zones, it just puts our students in far more danger. Early polls for the 2012 election showed Trump as one of the leading candidates. In December 2011, Trump was ranked sixth in the 10 most admired men and women living of 2011, according to a telephone survey conducted by USA Today and Gallup. However, Trump said in May 2011 that he would not run for the office after several months unofficially campaigning. In 2013, Trump spoke at the Conservative Political Action Conference. And in October, some New York Republicans, notably Joseph Borelli and Carl Palladino, who later served as New York State co-chairman for the presidential campaign, 
urged Trump run for governor of the state in 2014. In January 2019, John Gogger, a former Liberty University employee, told the Wall Street Journal that Trump's fixer Michael Cohen hired him to manipulate the Drudge Report and CNBC online polls in his favor in 2014 and 2015. In February 2015, Trump did not renew his broadcast deal for a reality television show he hosts for, fueling rumors about his 2016 presidential run. According to a memo leaked by WikiLeaks on April 7, 2015, Hillary Clinton's team directed the Democratic National Convention to focus on charming candidates such as Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, and Ben Carson. Donald Trump became the first president of the United States to be elected without prior public service experience when he was inaugurated in 2017. He learned how to cultivate political relationships with New York City Democratic office holders from his father, Fred Trump, who used friendships and campaign contributions to gain special treatment from politicians who influenced the rules and tax policies that affected his real estate interests. The 2016 presidential campaign of Donald Trump was officially launched on June 16, 2015 at Trump Tower in New York City. Trump was the Republican nominee for President of the United States in the 2016 election, having won the majority of state primaries, groups, and delegates at the Republican National Convention. Ladies and gentlemen, I am officially running for President of the United States, and we are going to make our country great again. He selected Mike Pence, the current governor of Indiana, as his vice presidential. During this campaign, he articulated ideas that would become central to his campaign and presidency, attracting both media attention and accusations of racism and intolerance. He opposed immigration from Central and South America, accusing Mexico of exporting drugs, criminals, and rapists to the U.S. I use the word rape. And yesterday it came out where this journey coming up, women are raped at levels that nobody's ever seen before. On November 8, 2016, Trump and Pence were elected as President and Vice President of the United States. It is my high honor and distinct privilege to introduce to you the president-elect of the United States of America, Donald Trump. There he is. You hear the music, you see the man, you see the family. The man who's just pulled off the most stunning, unbelievable upset in American political history. Trump's popular stand in opposition to illegal immigration and numerous trade agreements, such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership, won him popularity, especially among voters who were male, white, blue-collar, working class, and without a college diploma. 2020 presidential campaigns have featured future-focused themes. Bill Clinton declared that he would build a bridge to the 21st century. Barack Obama promised, in the midst of an economic crisis, to bring the change we need for the challenges ahead. However, Trump announced that his re-election campaign slogan would be, Keep America Great. He was claiming that he had made America great, and he would maintain it that way. To emphasize the point, the campaign's motto became, Promises Made, Promises Kept. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America great again. God bless you and good night. I love you. It was quite shocking when Trump, who clearly believes himself a marketing genius, abruptly declared on May 8th that he was changing his slogan to transition to greatness. He explained his selection this way. It was a statement that came out, and it could not have been better. We can go to Madison Avenue and hire the smartest, most brilliant minds in the world to create a slogan, but that is the one we will use. Transition to greatness.
Trump's re-election campaign was eventually unsuccessful. The 2020 election was won by the Democratic Party ticket of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. This was the first time since 1992 that an incumbent president lost re-election. We did it. We did it, Joe. You're going to be the next president of the United States. <laughs> U.S. history and Christianity. America is the country with the shortest founding history, but has risen to become most powerful in fields like economics, technology, military, science. And this success can be attributed to their faith in God. Up to 95% of the population, from the common class to the elite, have a strong belief in God, which is quite rare in any other country around. In American history, the first legislators took the Bible as the standard established laws, and they solved social problems through the Spirit of God as expressed in the Bible. The scriptures are also believed to be the foundation that birthed the United States Constitution which helps the country to be at the peak of development. Religion is widely practiced, diverse, and active in the United States. The U.S. is significantly more religious than other wealthy Western countries. The vast majority of Americans believe in a higher power, engage in spiritual practices, and identify as religious or spiritual. Christianity is the most widely declared religion, with the majority of Americans identifying as evangelicals, mainline Protestants, or Catholics. Religious freedom is guaranteed by the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. Many religious experts attribute this, as well as the country's separation of church and state, for its high level of religiosity. By not having a state church, it escaped the religious turmoil and conflict that European civilization brings. Religious diversity have long been in existence throughout its history. During colonial times, Anglicans, Quakers, and other mainline Protestants, as well as Mennonites, came from northwestern Europe. Various contrasting Protestants who had left the Church of England significantly changed the priestly landscape. The United States boasts the world's largest Christian and Protestant population. According to Gallup, 75% of Americans report praying often or occasionally, and religion plays a very 46% or very 26% essential part in their lives. Judaism is the second largest religion in the United States, with 2% of the population practicing it, followed by Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam, all of which have 1%. Mississippi is the most religious state in the country with 63% of its adult population described as very religious, saying that religion is important to them and attending religious services almost every week. New Hampshire, with only 20% of its adult population described as very religious, is the least religious state. The Congress is overwhelmingly religious. Both the Republican and Democratic parties typically nominate candidates who are Christians. As represented by Martin Luther King Jr. Jimmy Carter and William Jennings Bryan, as well as many Christian gain the right of a politician, and they had a significant impact on the country's politics. Christianity is the most prevalent religion in the United States, accounting for 73.7% of the adult population in 2016, with the vast majority of American Christians belonging to a Protestant denomination or an offshoot. According to the March 2017 Bulletin of the Association of Statisticians of American Religious Bodies, based on 2010 data, Christians were the largest religious population in the country's 3,143 counties. Approximately 48.9% of Americans are Protestants, 23.0% are Catholics, and 1.8% are Mormons. Christianity emerged during the period of European colonization. According to membership data from recent studies and official websites, the five largest Christian denominations are The Catholic Church in the United States has 70 million members. The Southern Baptist Convention has 13 million members. The National Baptist Convention, USA, Incorporation, has 8.4 million members. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has 6.9 million members. The United Methodist Church has 5.7 million members. With over 13 million members, the Southern Baptist Convention is the largest of the more than 200 separate Protestant groups. In 2007, 
26% of Americans were members of evangelical churches, 18% belonged to mainline Protestant churches, and 7% to historically black churches. According to a 2015 research, the country has over 450,000 Christian believers from Muslim backgrounds, the majority of whom practice Protestantism. In 2010, roughly 180,000 Arab Americans and 130,000 Iranian Americans converted from Islam to Christianity. Dudley Woodbury, a Fulbright researcher of Islam, thinks that 20,000 Muslims convert to Christianity each year in the United States. Beginning around 1600, Northwestern European settlers brought the Anglican and Puritan religions, as well as the Baptist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Quaker, and Moravian churches. Historians believe that adherents of mainline Protestant denominations have held positions of leadership in many areas of American life, including politics, business, science, the arts, and higher education, because they founded the majority of the country's premier higher education institutions. According to Harriet Zuckerman, 72% of American Nobel Prize laureates between 1901 and 1972 came from Protestant backgrounds. Most of the wealthiest and most educated religious groups are either Episcopalian or Presbyterian. Mainline Protestant faiths created several of America's first colleges and universities, including Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Dartmouth, Pennsylvania, Duke, Boston, Williams, Bowdoin, Middlebury, and Amherst. According to James Hunter, private schools and colleges founded by the mainline denominations tend to still seek to be seen as places that promote values, but very few will go as far as to brand themselves as Christian. On the whole, the distinctive identity of mainline Protestantism has declined significantly since the 1960s. The Great Awakenings led to the founding of numerous Christian organizations in America. New Protestant denominations like Adventism, non-denominational movements like the Restoration Movement, which eventually split into the Churches of Christ, the Christian Churches and Churches of Christ, and the Christian Church also known as Disciples of Christ, Jehovah's Witnesses also known as Bible Students, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints all arose, along with interdenominational evangelicalism and Pentecostalism. The increase in Catholics in the United States has been primarily attributed to immigrants from Ireland, Hispanic, Italian, Portuguese, French-Canadian, Polish, German, and Lebanese or Maronite countries. Before 1900, the majority of Catholic immigrants were, by far, Irish and German. Since then, the Catholic Church has established hundreds of other colleges and universities as well as thousands of primary and secondary schools. Schools such as the University of Notre Dame are ranked first in their state, Indiana, while Georgetown University is first in the District of Columbia. Catholic universities are also among the top 100 institutions in the United States. Eastern Orthodox Christianity has been present in North America since Russian colonization of Alaska. However, Alaska did not become a United States territory until 1867, and the majority of Eastern Orthodox Russian residents in Alaska returned to Russia upon the American acquisition of the territory. However, the native converts and a few priests stayed behind, so Alaska is still represented. The majority of Eastern Orthodox Christians arrived in the contiguous United States as immigrants in the late 19th and 20th centuries. During the 19th century, two major streams of Eastern Christianity also came to America. Eastern Orthodoxy was brought to America by Greek, Ukrainian, Serbian, and other Eastern European immigrants. What are your views on this election message? Do you believe Trump will win or not? Leave your comment below, also like, share, and don't forget to subscribe for more exciting videos.